All right, everyone, I am here with Charlene Chambliss. Charlene is a machine learning engineer at Primer AI. Charlene, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thanks. I'm stoked to be here. Uh, I'm excited to have you on the show. You mentioned before we got started that you've been listening to the show for a while and uh, excited to find yourself on the other the other side of the, I don't know, the other side of the podcast or whatever the right uh, analogy is. Uh, How did you originally find the show? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I think I was just searching around for, you know, machine learning podcasts that I could listen to because this was uh, pretty early on in my uh, data science journey. And so I was like, how do, how can I figure out like what it's actually like to work on this stuff and hear more people kind of talking about their experience and that sort of thing. And this show like exactly hit the mark for that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for sticking around and great to, to have you on the show. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that journey. You're currently working in natural language processing. Like, how did it all come together for you? Yeah, for sure. So it's uh, been a a bit of a winding road because I'm kind of an unconventional candidate for this sort of thing. Um, But NLP is kind of known for that. So maybe that's why I ended up here. Um, So I studied psychology at Stanford. And then when I graduated in 2017, I got my first job in social media marketing. But then I figured out pretty quickly that that wasn't really for me. Um, And so I ended up kind of researching different careers that I could maybe pivot into that might be a better fit. And data science is what I ended up landing on. Um, And so I went through this epic journey of, you know, study for the GRE, uh, (laughs) go and start a master's in statistics. And um, partway through that, I landed my first data science internship at Curology, where I got to learn a bunch about um, how data science works in like the B2C space, um, which was really interesting. Um, And then is that, Sorry, curology, is that Curology with Xavier or Maitre? Um is that Curology, the, the, the skincare company. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. I forget yeah. what his uh what his company is called. Yeah, yeah. So they're a prescription skincare company. Um, they will send you like prescription skincare straight to your door. Uh, mostly they do acne, but they're also in the anti-aging space. Um, and it, it actually works, which is great. <laughs> um Yeah. So then after I left Curology, uh, I decided that I wanted to get specifically into NLP um, because I was very interested in more the machine learning side of things as opposed to the analytics side of things. Um, And so I signed up for Sharpest Minds, which is a data science mentorship program where they kind of pair you with someone and they like advise you as you work on like an actual like production quality sort of uh, project. Um, And then they also help you prep for interviews and that sort of thing. And so I did my project. I got paired with an awesome mentor. Her name's uh, Nina Lopatina, and uh, she is at Incutel Labs. Um, And yeah, not soon after I finished my project with her, uh, I got an offer to join Primer full time. Awesome. What was your project? Uh, it was, it's called Multilingual NER. And essentially I, uh, I trained BERT to do uh, named entity recognition in English and Russian. Um, So two separate models, actually, not the same model. Although, in theory, you could probably do it all in one model. So a separate model for English and Russian. Uh, In fact, you've been doing a ton of stuff with BERT recently. And I should have mentioned we met, uh, actually, you were one of the amazing people that I met at our recent Twimmelfest conference, we had a NLP office hours and you and some of your colleagues joined. Um, and so I, that's how I know that you've been doing all this cool stuff with Bert. Uh, I'd love to kind of get your sense of, um, you know, what your experience has been trying to apply Bert and these types of models in a, a practical setting. And then we can kind of dig a little bit deeper into, you know, that first project and, and some of the ones you've been doing since. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Bert is probably the biggest paradigm shift that has happened in NLP recently. Um, it's, it's a, a, an ancestor of the transformer model, which essentially transformed uh, the whole NLP space um, with kind of just how effective it is at various tasks. Um, and so it uh, it turns out that you can you can apply BERT to basically any task that you would apply um, an ordinary NLP model like an RNN or, or any of the previous ones to, um, except it tends to just be much better kind of across the board. Um, 
And so there are all kinds of interesting things you can do with it um, that are kind of unlocked, like, uh, you know, machine translation is now much better now that we have BERT models. Um, a lot of uh, commercial applications of NLP are essentially opening up now because of BERT and, and because of transformers. And so this first project you did was this, uh, these NER models. Uh, tell us a little bit about those projects. What were you, and were these like, you know, toy projects or, you know, how built out were, were these projects relative to the, the uh, stuff that you've ended up working on at, in a commercial context at Primer? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess compared to my work at Primer, you know, the the other project was a toy project. But <laughs> um, the the idea behind the project was, uh, you know, IQT has um, machine translation models uh, that go from Russian to English, and they wanted to build an interface um, for a translator to actually assess the quality of the translation. Um, and so the reason I built the the NER models uh, named Entity Recognition um, was so that they could actually detect and highlight the entities in the interface um, so that the translator could more easily see, you know, did this person's name get mistransliterated or something like that in the process of uh, translating. And so it was kind of interesting because it was like using machine learning to assess the quality of, of another machine learning model. Uh huh. And uh, so, yeah, I built the two models for that. And then I also built kind of a, an interactive demo to like test the quality of the predictions of both models um, to kind of give like a, a prototypical sense of what it could look like once it was actually in their, um, in their demo or in their interface. Nice. And were you, you mentioned there are two models, were they essentially the same model architecturally, but trained on two different data sets or were there different tricks or things that you needed to do for Russian or English relative to the other? Oh, great question. Uh, they were actually two different uh, models. So one was multilingual BERT. Um, so it was not like a Russian specific model, but it was a multilingual model that could handle any language in theory. Um, and then the other one was just the straight uh, BERT based English model, I believe. Uh, and uh, they did need different data sets. So I actually kind of scoured the web and like collected all the data sets that I could find for, <laughs> for English NER and for Russian NER. Um, and uh, there was a lot of kind of crazy pre-processing that went into that. Like uh, doing a token level classification project actually used to be much harder um, because there was a lot of kind of, uh, if you had the data stored in, uh and you know spans then you would have to like translate that somehow to bio tags um where bio stands for begin inside outside and it kind of uh describes like at a token by token level like is this an entity or not and which entity is it um and so <laughs> there's just a lot of uh, a lot of code that you have to write in order to like standardize these data sets sometimes and not even interesting ml code but like just text parsing just algorithms, yeah. <laughs> and, and so you said used to. How would you approach that today? Um, yeah. So actually today, uh, Hugging Face Transformers, the um, kind of all-star NLP library for doing any sort of deep learning related NLP, um, they recently implemented something they're calling the fast tokenizers. And um, you can actually tokenize a piece of text with them and it'll give you back like the exact character offsets um, that each uh, post-tokenized token was originally at in the original text. And so it makes it much easier oh. to kind of align spans with tokens. And so you you no longer have to write like a ton of boilerplate code around this. It's actually much easier. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, so I would recommend everyone check out the new fast tokenizers because uh, if you haven't used uh, transformers in in a year, there's been a lot of changes since then. Awesome. And you, speaking of kind of interesting new stuff that you had a chance to play around with, uh, Streamlit is what you built your demo in. Um, and I've been hearing a ton of cool stuff about Streamlit. I haven't played with it much myself, but did you enjoy working with that? Yeah, I love Streamlit. Streamlit, I've actually uh, evangelized it to my whole team and I got a couple other people using it. So we're, we're fans of Streamlit here at Primer. Um, and what it does essentially is it kind of, um, you know, if you're you're a data scientist or an ML engineer and you want to show off maybe the outputs of some model, 
uh, you know, you would ordinarily have to like dump that into a plain text document or a Google Doc or something just to share it around. But now what you can do is you can actually like whip up a really quick front end that's interactive um, with your model and you can just send the link around to people and they can play with it. Um, and so that avoids the whole process of like spinning up a web app and like writing all yeah. the flask stuff and <laughs> whatever else you would normally do in order to have um, like a, a demo or something interactive um, to mess with your model. And so it makes it much easier to share. And it's got a library of like really cool IO widgets. So folks can, like you said, kind of play around with it, tune, tune different things or see how the model reacts to changes in these inputs. Um, totally. Yeah. It, it looks like a notebook. Otherwise. Yes, yes, exactly. It um, it really kind of democratizes kind of access to experimentation um, with the model. Nice. And so uh, this Russian and these Russian and English uh, NER models were your first, was that your first NLP project or your first like significant NLP project or... Uh, I would say so. Um, so I had done, you know, regex uh, at Curology for like extracting stuff um, in the SQL database and whatnot. Um, and then I had also done some work with word to vec and, and things like that. Um, basic engrams, things, things of that nature. But uh, that was my first deep learning NLP project. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And you've worked on a few since uh, what, Tell us a little bit about the the BERT projects you've worked on at, at Primer. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one that was really interesting was um, we used, we've had success using SpanBERT for relation extraction. Uh, SpanBERT is a, it's BERT, but it was pre-trained on uh, spans instead of uh, just predicting a single token for the mass language modeling objective. Um and so it actually, it turns out it does much better for tasks such as question answering um, or any sort of span extraction task. Um, and so we found out that this was uh, Tom's idea from my team um, that you can actually use natural language questions um, uh, combined with SpanBert and, and the document that you're asking the questions on, and you can get like actual relations out of them. So for an example, you can you can say, you know, on a, on a document that says John Bunsen, analyst at Morgan Stanley or something like that, uh, and you say, who employs John Bunsen? The model will tell you Morgan Stanley uh, because it oh. actually it actually can do reading comprehension. So it can answer sort of like those SAT style questions. Um, and so you can you can actually just do relation extraction uh, with an, a natural language model, which is pretty interesting. And is this using an off-the-shelf uh, model, like a pre-trained model, or are you doing a lot of fine-tuning to get it to do the, the relationships? Yeah, typically um, you would want to use a model that's at the very least fine-tuned on Squad, Squad 2.0, um, because it also, Squad 2.0 versus Squad 1.0 um, is a, it's a question answering data set that includes uh, impossible questions. And so the model doesn't necessarily have to produce an answer to every question. Sometimes there's no actual answer in the text and you would want it to not produce an answer. Um, so yeah, once, once you, uh, fine tune it on squad, um, you then fine tune it on kind of your own custom data set, depending on what relation you want to do. So we found that for, you know, the employer example that I gave before, it takes around 800 labeled data points, um, which is actually quite low, um, <laughs> for typically for a deep learning use case. So it turns out that squad can kind of do a lot of the heavy lifting there by basically just teaching the model reading comprehension and there are only a few specific patterns that you kind of need to get ironed out depending on what your question is. And so in that case, did you, did you hand curate your own label data set or did you, you know, try to, I mean, there's a lot of effort that you'd have to go into to maybe use something from Wikipedia or something for only 800. Um, but did you? Yes. Uh, so thankfully at Primer, we have like uh, millions of news documents <laughs> that we can work with. And so uh, <laughs> already tagged. I, 
Well, not already tagged. Uh, I went over to our Elasticsearch database and uh, they are already tagged with the named entities. Um, yeah. And so any, I just queried for, you know, documents that have um, both a person and an organization in them, for example. And then I was able to like kind of extract training examples from that. Uh, but I would still have to actually label them as to like, whether or not the relation actually exists between a given person and an organization. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that work happened kind of by hand, uh, just by myself. Uh, I, I outsourced it to our team at first, and then I, I kind of wanted to iterate a little bit faster. So I kind of just uh, labeled the rest myself. <laughs> and now if you didn't have access to that database that Primer has, how would you go about uh, trying to solve that particular problem or d collect that? the data for that particular problem just find news articles yeah i would probably try scraping the web uh you could probably use wikipedia for some examples but i'm not sure that it would um it would capture all of the cases so for example sometimes the way that uh journalists are referred to is like you know uh cnn's ashley williams and like you're not really going to see that in wikipedia but you do want the model to know that Ashley mm -hmm. Williams works for CNN. And so, um, yeah, you would want to make sure you're getting diverse examples if possible. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm curious along the, the lines of um, the data collection and um, I, I'm, I guess I'm curious, you know, from what I know of Primer, you're primarily <laughs> trying to solve, you know, these NLP projects for kind of large, you know, large scale NLP projects for large companies. Um, for folks that that aren't familiar with the name, I've got an interview uh, that we can drop in the show notes with John Bohannon from back in the day where he walked us through this project that uh, essentially tried to extract information out of archive. Uh, I'm not sure if that's something that is still you know, alive at Primer, but it was a really interesting project. Um, and uh, one of the things we touched on on that interview was the, um, you know, just all that has to go into kind of real world production NLP systems. And you talked about how you still have your re regex, you know, uh, in your, in your, pipeline and uh all these traditional techniques this was now two three years ago uh and i'm curious how you know you've seen that evolve and what the uh you know what are some of the things that you're doing in the real world to uh make these nlp projects work at scale that you know may be different from the that initial ner project you did out of the accelerator yeah, that's a great question, actually. And uh, Primer Science is still alive, actually, the uh, the archive project. Um, uh, so one thing that you run into when you're trying to use these very, um, very complex deep learning models in production is that they're just very big um, and their inference time is is long. So much, much longer than even something like regex, which is kind of considered to be like a long running sort of algorithm. Um and so one thing you have to do is, um, in a lot of cases, you have to do some kind of inference triage. And so what that means is upstream of your model, you would want to implement some rules or heuristics uh, to actually uh, filter out documents that you don't think are going to have a result or you don't think are going to be relevant to your model. So, for example, for the um, person employed by relation extraction model, like if the if the document doesn't have both a person and an organization in it, you probably shouldn't bother passing it to the model because it's not going to find anything. Um, and uh, the the same thing for you know uh, the the COVID classifiers that I've also worked on recently, where it it uh, classifies documents based on uh, whether they're related to COVID and some topic, such as the healthcare impact. Uh, you don't want to pass any documents to that model unless they actually mention, you know, COVID or coronavirus or something like that. And so, you know, regex and things like that can actually have um, a big benefit, like as part of a pipeline like this, and even uh, as as like a standalone sort of tool. Like recently, we were we were asked to do kind of a proof of concept for summarizing uh, a like a very long sort of report. Uh, and we found that regex did pretty much fine as opposed to like training a custom model to, uh, extract like these certain 
sections of the report. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I definitely, I love deep learning and uh, so does everyone on my team, but we, it's certainly not the like be all end all and, and like no one should feel bad about using the old school NLP uh, methods when that's the right approach. Yeah. Uh, I want to come back to that summarization problem because it's one I've always found interesting, but the, um, so the, the first is the first kind of real world lesson is this inference triage where it sounds like essentially you're managing your compute costs for the most part, um, by trying to triage the, ex the examples that you send over for inference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you don't want to be wasting, uh, compute hours <laughs> with these models because they're just so large, um, yeah. and they're, they're expensive to run. So. Yeah, any other uh, any other things that jump out at you in terms of kind of real world NLP lessons? Um, probably the biggest thing is that when you are working on NLP in sort of an academic um, sense, the the data sets are considered to be fixed. Um, and so you're just really optimizing the model to perform well on the data set. Um, which I, I guess you're sort of doing um, also in industry, you're optimizing the, the model to do well on your data set, but like your data set also needs to continually change and evolve based on your model's performance. So it's, it's super iterative and um, often the, the highest leverage way to improve the performance of your model in industry settings is to just get more data for it. Um, as opposed to, you know, kind of fiddling with the hyperparameters or like doing any of that stuff. It's often yeah. just like a data curation problem. Um, and so the better you can get at uh, figuring out where the data you need lives, um, the better you're going to be at training high-performing NLP models. Yeah, I always find it interesting that we say get more data. And I think people hear that and think, okay, so more of the same data but it's not always more of the same data. It's you know often more of different kinds of data around the same problem. I kind of got that in what you were saying that you're looking for different sources that complement the data that you already have. Is that the case? Yes, exactly. So you want to get the data that's going to be kind of challenging for your model or like you need to systematically kind of uh, look at the mistakes that your model is making and then, you know, use your human pattern recognition abilities to see kind of like, oh, what are the grammatical structures that my model is failing on? What are these sorts of words that and vocabulary that tend to trip it up? Uh, what kind of words and vocabulary is it not noticing are associated with like the subject that I'm interested in? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of that kind of, uh, just analysis that goes into like figuring out which data to get that would actually improve your model. Because like you said, getting more of the same data can actually be harmful. <laughs> so I, I found that, um, when I was training the, uh, the employer extraction model, uh, I, I had labeled an additional like 300 data points that were like all roughly the same structure. So like person name, comma, title at company. Uh, and I gave those to the model <laughs> and it did like 20% worse in terms of recall because it just like completely overfit to that pattern. Um, and so that was a, a, a good lesson that, you know, don't, don't spend an extra two hours labeling more of the same data point. Um, make sure to actually go out and find like the very diverse examples. Mm -hmm. And do you use or have you created uh, any tools that help out with that? You, you mentioned it's a lot of it is kind of using your human intuition, but are there ways to automate that part of it that you've come across? Um, to some extent. So uh, I actually wrote kind of a, a suite of scripts and, and utilities that kind of surround this relation extraction model building process um, at Primer. And so those all live in, in our kind of proprietary deep learning repo. Um, but essentially... Um, it, it just makes it very fast to kind of evaluate the precision and recall in F1 of your model at like the various thresholds um, that you would uh, like bar the model's confidence at. Um, and so you can also uh, kind of, you can also classify the, um, the model's responses as like, you know, true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative. Um, 
and uh, kind of put those in a pandas data frame and then kind of very easily like query that along with the example. And then, and then you can kind of just like read through them very easily as opposed to kind of just throwing random examples at the model and, and seeing uh, what happens. <laughs> so there, there are definitely kind of pipelines that you can build um, that'll make the whole process a little bit faster. All right. So uh, along the lines of this kind of real world experience, that last example, you know, made me think of debugging. Uh, what, what's been your experience with debugging and, you know, what are some of the tricks that you like to employ along the lines of the last one, putting the responses in the pandas data frame? Are there other tricks that you've uh, come across? Hmm. I don't know if I would classify that as debugging. Um. Although the the number one tip for debugging is probably use a debugger. <laughs> so if you haven't already learned to use the debugger in VS Code, um, because it's it's awesome and very useful. Um, in terms of making things faster, I would say just if you if you realize that you're doing something uh, over and over again, just write a script. You know, with with variables that you can. Uh, insert in from the command line. Um, just don't be afraid to automate your workflow, essentially, if you're if you're doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I was thinking more like model debugging, like, you know, these models, we talk about it all the time. They're kind of opaque. We're not really sure why they're doing what they're doing in a lot of instances. And um, you, I, I took the take the model responses and the input and put it in a data frame as a tool for trying to figure out, you know, where the model is making mistakes and, and using that data to correct the model. And I'm just curious if there were other examples of things that you do or tools that you've created or identified to help you narrow in on when the model is, you know, getting caught or tripped up or something or overfitting on the wrong thing or what have you. Yeah, I know. I'm actually myself on the lookout for just a really good tool for that <laughs> because it, it would be such a huge help w uh, for building models more quickly and, and improving their performance more quickly. Um, so we, we are kind of working on something like that uh, at Primer. Um, but uh, one thing that my teammate uh, Nick Egan did recently actually was he um, he devised a method for computing saliency maps on NLP models, where saliency maps are, are sort of a computer vision concept where you can kind of, uh, you know, you show a picture to the model and then it sort of highlights what it was looking at when it classified the picture a certain way. Um, and so you can see the actual pixels that were most salient to the model. Um, and so the way it works for uh, the NLP models is that uh, you know, when the model uh, classifies an example, it will highlight the tokens uh, in the document that were the most salient to that classification. And um, what Nick found is that this method just works super well. Um, and uh, so when you feed it, you know, for the, the COVID classifiers, for example, if we're thinking about like the, the business impact of COVID or like the employment impact of COVID, uh, you feed it an example and then the model will go and highlight like, uh, you know, such and such company experienced 10,000 layoffs this week or something like that. Um, and then the rest of the, the article is not really quite as salient, but like it, it sees that one sentence and it's like, oh yeah, this is about the employment impacts of COVID. Um, and so that's one thing that we found actually that works surprisingly well. Um, but I don't think it's really like in the mainstream quite yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you've run across any surprises in analyzing those saliency maps. I'm thinking of a conversation, this is also maybe a couple of years ago with Alvin Grissom, where he did some research that showed that uh, the NLP models he was looking at at the time would kind of, they would pick up on, you know, the most meaningless words in the sentence to, to determine their meaning or to you know, make decisions based on. I'm wondering if that comes up in the, the work that you're doing. I don't think he was doing anything with, uh, you know, with BERT or anything quite as sophisticated. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So 
Uh, recently, John Bohannon, who you mentioned earlier, my manager, um, trained a, I believe it's ExcelNet. It was an ExcelNet model uh, to see if we could classify whether news was fake news or not. So if, if it was like uh, generated by GBT2 or something. Um, and we couldn't, we had a little bit of a hard time actually interpreting the saliency maps because it, it seemed like the model might have been paying attention to sort of like certain entities like Trump or like sensationalist language. Um, and so we didn't get like a, a super good read on like what the model had learned for that particular problem, even though like the performance on its face, like the accuracy was really good. Um, so that's something that we want to look more into. Um, but the, I think the fact that the, the saliency was not super clear cut um, is, uh, is potentially concerning and something that we would want to examine more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, you mentioned this COVID classifier. Can you tell us a little bit more about that project and what you were looking to do? Yeah, for sure. So um, recently we wanted to retrain uh, a classifier that we have. It's a 10 class classifier, so a multi-class classifier uh, or multi-label classifier, I should say, because they can, uh, documents can be more than one class. Um, and what this model does is it detects um, COVID related events in the news. So developments in science and technology related to COVID, such as new vaccine progress or new clinical trials, um, business impacts, uh, employment impacts, healthcare impacts, um, election impacts, things like that. Um, and, uh, what I did was, um, we wanted to address topic drift because the original model had been trained back in sort of like the March, June kind of range of 2020. And this was now like, uh, October. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. the way that people talked about COVID and the sort of settings that COVID appeared in um, and the numbers related to the number of COVID cases were all sort of different um, relative to earlier this year. And so um, we wanted to make sure the, the model would still perform really well. And so um, as I was kind of going into this uh, retraining project, I was like, well, I don't know if we should just kind of blindly pull data on this because it turns out that like most documents are not actually related to COVID, um, even though COVID has kind of overtaken our, our mind share. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, if you, if you just do a random sample of documents, you're only going to get like a few percentage points worth of documents that are about COVID. Um, and so what I did was I used um, this, uh, cool sampling technique um, from this paper called Similarity Search for Efficient Active Learning and Search of Rare Concepts, um, which is uh, from the computer vision space. Again, uh, we, we draw a lot of inspiration from there. Um, and I was able to actually sample documents that were nearest neighbors of previously labeled documents that were positive for each of the, the classes. Um, and so I just got those documents labeled. And uh, it turned out that we were able to increase the recall for almost all of the classes by um, sometimes huge margins, like up to 20% uh, increased recall. And um, the original training data set size was like uh, 5,000 documents, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to get these big increases with only like a total of an additional 400 and something training documents and, and the, mm -hmm. the other couple hundred documents I used for evaluation. Um, and so it was, it was kind of cool to see how well that technique paid off. And so the nearest neighbor was with respect to what metric? Uh, good question. Yeah. So um, we have all of our documents stored with uh, SIF embeddings, which stands for smooth inverse frequency. Um, it's kind of like TF IDF, but faster. Um, and I think it performs either equally as well or a little bit better in our experience, um, in terms of like finding similar documents. Um, and so that would have been just, uh, some kind of distance measure, probably cosine distance. Yeah, I think it's cosine distance. Nice. And so you, you, <clears throat> what's the relationship between the distance and the the new documents in the training set that you introduce? Um, 
So the the idea was to get um, new documents that are nearest neighbors of the old positive documents. So if a, a document was marked positive for like a uh, global economy sort of disruption um, with regard to COVID, then the, the new document would be sort of close to it, um, but not necessarily like exactly the same event because I, I made sure to also... Um, institute that it had to be you know more recent in time uh as opposed to like the older documents since the whole point was to address topic drift Mm -hmm. got it yeah it makes me think of your earlier point where you don't want to provide too much of the same data or data that falls into the same pattern and it strikes me that doing a nearest neighbor approach to select your new data could run a risk of that potentially Um, but then you're, if the new training examples are far, then, you know, w- once you pass some distance threshold, it's just not relevant to COVID or anything, really. Yeah, exactly. So the, the exact way that I did this was we, we actually have an API um, where you can kind of do this query uh, to get the nearest neighbors. And um, I set the parameters very, very low for similarity. So it's like the least similar possible nearest neighbor that you could get. <laughs> um, okay. And so, it, you know, it is probably still closer in, in distance than, you know, a totally unrelated document. But it, I, I actually like looked through the examples and they were not of the same event or like Uh, events that were overly similar, um, at least anecdotally. Yeah. Got it. And you said this was what model? Um, This was ExcelNet. ExcelNet? Mm -hmm. Um, What have you done much work with ExcelNet? Like, tell us about ExcelNet. Uh, Yeah, ExcelNet's great. Uh, Just like BERT, you know, (laughs) it's uh, it's probably the best thing you can use for classification right now. Um, I would recommend it. Uh, Yeah. We, uh, cool. we use it for pretty much all of our classifiers these days. If we need to build a new classifier, it's always ExcelNet. Okay. And uh, are you doing much with uh, multitask types of problems? Um, hmm. Not yet at the moment. My, my understanding of uh, multitask NLP is that it's still kind of difficult and, and hit and miss at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we're we we might still be waiting a little bit for that to get proven out some more um but uh we we definitely are in the business of kind of composing like stacks of ml models so recently we um we've devised kind of a successful approach to uh, detecting and analyzing disputed information and disputed events um in the news and that whole stack is composed of like four different models i can go into that a little bit if you're interested yeah sure yeah, so uh, what we're working on right now on the threat detection team is um, exactly this, d- detecting disputed information in the news where disputed information is um, is sort of our label for like potential disinformation, basically mm-hmm. information that at least two parties disagree on. Um, and so we had to train around four separate models uh, to get like a coherent approach to this. Um And so the first model essentially detects, like, is there a dispute um, in this document? Like, are there at least two entities disagreeing about something? The next model actually goes through and extracts all the claims that are being made on either side. Um, And then the next model attributes all of those claims and, like, gets the entities that actually said each of those claims um, or made each of those claims. And then lastly, we we kind of group the different claims into sides. Um, and then we display those sides. And uh, that is kind of something that's never been done before. I, I guess I would consider that kind of like a multi sort of model um, project. But uh, yeah, we basically had to kind of design that from scratch because there was no kind of precedent in the literature or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And each of the individual models are trained independently as opposed to end to end? Yeah, they are trained independently, although, um, you know, the the same, they're trained independently in the sense that, like, they're each doing a different task. But, of course, we did reuse some some of the same data set just because it's good that they're all familiar with, like, the the kind, the way that, like, disputed events look, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the source data in this example is, like, are we talking about news articles or tweets or reports or something different? 
Yeah, so news articles mainly for now, um, although we are working on incorporating tweets into the stack as well. Um, but mm-hmm. that will probably uh, involve retraining the models to some extent because tweets are very different kinds of documents uh, compared to mm-hmm. news articles. Cool. Uh, speaking of, we talked about circling back to summarization. Uh, I'd love to hear a bit about your experience on summarization type projects. Uh, yeah. So I have not personally worked on building summarization models at Primer, but um, people on my team have, and I helped them out with um, the kind of research and experiments that they were doing around that. Um, and so my involvement mainly has involved uh, helping to design like good data labeling tasks for evaluating summaries. Um, and so one instance of that was we were trying to evaluate um how our summarization model does against uh, one of Microsoft's summarization models and then also LexRank, which is just a purely extractive um, summarization model. Um, And what we did was we had to kind of break up uh, the quality of a summary into like several different categories. Um, You know, one is compactness. So how compact is the summary? One is informativeness. How informative is the summary? Uh, fluency, how well does it read? Um, And then we also had to evaluate whether there were any factual errors in the summary, because that's still a very common problem uh, with summarization models right now, even the state of the art ones. Um, And so, yeah, my my task was essentially to to help the team out with um, designing a coherent uh, labeling task and giving good definitions and examples of those, um, which my psychology background helped a bit with. Mm. And uh, on the scheme of tasks that you design labeling uh, tasks for, that one sounds like it'd be on the harder side. Yes? Yes. Yes. It was very hard. (laughs) It was also hard because um, it wasn't like really natively supported by our our labeling platform at the time. Um, Okay. uh, Not not our labeling platform labeling, but the labeling platform that we used um, for data labeling. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, the issue was like, you ideally you want to be able to present these with like uh you know the document the summary and then kind of a multiple choice flow where they can answer like how informative is this how whatever is this on a scale of one to five or something but instead we had to have them actually like highlight uh you know the (laughs) the quality name so like fluency they had to highlight fluency and then like classify it as a certain class and so that was kind of our hacky workaround (laughs) Mm. for how we made it work in the labeling platform and when so you, there's there's lots of stuff like that um in in real world machine learning <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, for labeling are you uh when you say labeling platform are you talking about a tool or are you talking about a tool that's kind of back-ended by uh you know crowdsourced labelers or you know a team of labelers uh, of you know some degree of sophistication or another so we very happily use uh, Odetta um, as okay. our uh, labeling provider. They are um, a, a wonderful organization, um, and they provide like basically full service labeling teams. Um, and so uh, the labeling platform that we use in concert with that um, is LightTag, and so that's um, that's kind of a separate thing. But it's it's nice for us to be able to bring our own labelers because we really like Odetta and we have a relationship with them. And like when you actually um, use the same labelers um, over time, like they they come to actually understand your task and um, you know care about what you're working on, as opposed to uh, kind of trying to outsource using Amazon MTurk or or something like that where you know you'll you'll have one labeler labeling for your project and never see them again um it really helps to kind of uh have that sort of knowledge building that happens over time when you have the same people working on your projects Mm -hmm. cool cool um what are the what are the most challenging projects that you you know, or your, your team works on? Is, is there a particular c- class or category of NLP project that is just kind of, you know, where the state of the art is and, and is just really hard, but people really want it? Yeah. So I would say <laughs> the, <laughs> the hardest problem that we're thinking about right now is something that we're calling information epidemiology. 
Um, and mm. what I mean by that is uh, like on the threat detection team, we would really like to know like um, where did this claim originate? For example, like, uh, um, you know, coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan or something like that. Yeah. Uh, who first said this? Like, where did this first blow up? Um, but we can't really do that with only a data set of news articles, for one thing, uh, because someone told me recently that it, it probably originated on, on Weibo or something like that. Um, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I guess we would <laughs> never have known that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so even even with news documents, though, it's kind of hard because like, um, you know, you search for something in Elasticsearch and what it's doing is it's it's searching based on like not exact match, but almost exact match. Um, and so you can search for like coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan, but you're only going to get the earliest document that said exactly those words, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to the earliest document that said um, that actually spun out the whole conspiracy theory around this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really challenging problem that we are still kind of trying to figure out. Like, how do we give our customers access to um, the earliest instance of something or the kind of the origin of something um, mm -hmm. and then be able to kind of trace that and it's spread forward through time and figure out like what communities did this propagate into, like which mm -hmm. publications did this emerge in um, and uh, kind of the, like the travel um, of a piece of information. Interesting. Interesting. I, with, when you're just looking for the first one, you know, that, strikes me at, well, it sounds like it's a difficult problem for you, but, you know, when you're starting to then talk about, you know, a graph of, you know, all of these documents and try to capture the relationship of them, that sounds even more crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's one thing to be able to find the earliest one. And then you also have to like figure out how it propagated and like, which, uh, which publication preceded the other publication and like how big are the audiences of these publications. And there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, you know, customers are interested in knowing about like how this information has spread um, that it's just, it's very tricky um, to figure out how to do it at this point, but it's, it's one of the things that's kind of very high on our, our to-do list. Mm -hmm. And are you doing much with the application of ideas like graphs or causality or, um, yeah, any number of kind of related topics that aren't typically thought of as uh, NLP? Um, so we do have a, a history of interest in this. So we have a, a, a project called Quicksilver, um, okay. which was like an, an entity graph. Um, and it's all about uh, kind of understanding the, the relationships between entities. Um, but right now we don't have kind of an active, uh, like active development going on, on like, uh, on specifically a graph approach to something like information epidemiology, but, um, it's something that we're definitely thinking about. We're, we're willing to explore whatever is going to get us to the, the solution. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, uh, before we wrap up any tips for folks that are, you know, interested in, you know, the, the things we're talking about NLP breaking into the field, uh, you know, landing your first gig at a awesome place like, like primer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So many tips. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've written, to, I've written a bit about this, um, okay. on my website, charlenechambliss.com. So it's just my name. Um, I also did an interview where I talked at much greater length uh, about what it took for me to get into data science. Cause like end to end, it was, it was like around a two year process for me to get here wow. um, from, from when I first decided to get into data science. Um, it won't be that long for everybody. It depends on what your background is, but coming from like largely a non-technical background, that was how long it took. Um, I would say if you really need help doing a project, sign up for a mentorship program uh, like Sharpest Minds. Um, I think it's it's really great in particular because like as an income share agreement, you don't actually have to pay anything unless you actually successfully land a job. Um, and so you're not, you know, stuck being in debt for something that didn't necessarily pay off. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out to me personally if you if you need resources for something because I'm always eager to help more folks get into this field. Awesome. Well, Charlene, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. It's been great to have you on the show. Yeah, so wonderful to chat with you, Sam. Thanks. Thank you.